Uh, tonight's street, um, it, it is it is a uh, sort of a holiday today. It is National Heart Month, and if you notice, going back in the old schedules, we always always had a cardiology conference in February, and this time we have the new chief of cardiology at New York Presbyterian Queens, Dr. David Slotweiner, who. Uh, you can look at the programs and see his wonderful background and so on. He is an electrophysiologist, which means he actually plays around with the electricity of your heart, but he knows everything about heart disease, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Please, if you ask, save your questions for later, raise your hands. If you prefer, write your questions down on the pads you have. Linda Spiegel from Teats is not here, but she did leave pads and so on for you. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask the questions for you if you prefer. Further, no further ado, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bright. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, Dr. Bright is a legend in Queens and uh, very flattered and honored to have this invitation. And I see uh, several familiar faces. Um, I want to make this fairly casual, so uh, I guess Dr. Bright has asked questions at the end, so we'll leave plenty of time for that. Um, I wanted to give you an update on some of the new um, aspects of cardiology that are really changing how we deliver care, and then um, identify some things that I think it's important for uh, everybody to know when, uh, what to look for for signs of heart disease, and how to try to prevent heart disease, even more importantly. <coughs> um, so, with uh, no further ado, let me go ahead and get started. Do you mind anything? Thanks. No, I have a pointer. Oh, we have a pointer? Wow. Yeah, where is it? It's, um... it's okay. You could do no, it. No, I no. could do it or you could no, do it. It's fine. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Whatever you want. Uh, I think uh, your husband has got the pointer, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it has a light if you wanted to show it. Put that oh, wow. in. It has a light, so if you wanted to show everybody specifics. It has okay. Too. Great. It's yeah, broken. Yeah, just put it out. It's broken. Yeah, it's okay. Just put it out. You know what they say. Once you put it in, you might not take it out. <clears throat> what do you have? Oh, I put it on the wrong side. That's why. Right. You busted this. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. All right. So then I just took this. Um, oh, that's the other one. Can you point it the other way. Uh, oh. Turn around. There we go. Okay. So just a list of things I wanted to touch on. There's a laser one also. On tonight. Okay. Uh, so in case like you want to show specifics. Okay. So um, just want to touch base on where we've come, uh, but explain that we still have a long way to go. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a cholesterol. Uh, we'll talk about some new coronary stent technology, which I think is really revolutionary. Uh, no. Oops. Technical take two. We're just waiting to boot up again. Uh, and we'll, yeah, it'll just take a second. Uh, and we'll talk about some different technology uh, for different types of heart disease. We've got some very exciting developments in how we treat valvular heart disease, how we treat different abnormal heart rhythms, such as atrial fibrillation. And even, uh, even uh, we don't quite have an artificial heart yet, but we have something pretty close. We have a mechanical device that can help support the circulatory system either as a bridge to a heart transplant, or for some people, even instead of a heart transplant. And that technology is going to come along, I think, very quickly over the next 10 years. Um, so what I wanted to show, if the slides come back up, I'll show you. Uh, I wanted to show you the progress we've made in treating uh, heart disease overall in the United States over the past 20 years. I have a slide from the CDC which shows uh, the dramatic reduction in overall number of deaths uh, in the United States from heart disease. And that's really a, 
uh, due to multiple different factors. One, people taking care of themselves, uh, getting exercise, uh, losing weight, not smoking, that's really key, and uh, treating diabetes. But it's also due to the new medications that we have for cholesterol, for example, uh, for blood thinners, and other medications to treat high blood pressure. And these are having a dramatic impact. I think uh, I was speaking earlier with somebody asking why, um, uh, when he was uh, younger, uh, people were dying in their 40s and 50s from heart attacks, and now they're not. Well, those are exactly the reasons. Um, there it is. Oh, right. Terrific. Um, great. So, focus. Focus. Perfect. I totally apologize. No worries. Um, and so let me go on to the next slide. So this is um, uh, where we stand today. So this is the slide I wanted to uh, point out. Just to show you, uh, this is the number of deaths per 100,000 people in the United States. Uh, the top line is all the cardiovascular deaths. Um, and that's combined with strokes, heart attacks, and other problems such as aneurysms. And you can see all of these are declining very, very steadily. This is from the Centers for Disease Control. They are a few years um, back in publishing numbers, but this is their most recent slide. But uh, as I was alluding to, we certainly haven't conquered the problem yet. Uh, in the United States, we have 800,000 people who die from cardiovascular disease every year, and that includes uh, heart disease, meaning heart attacks, stroke, and vascular disease. And that makes heart disease still the number one cause of death in the United States and the cause of death for one in three people within the U.S. So our work is far from done. Now, the things that we're doing right that are getting better are we've been improving smoking cessation, cholesterol, treatment's gotten much better. We've gotten better stents, we've gotten better medications, and we've gotten better surgical therapies. But on the downside, we all, I think, are aware of the epidemic of obesity. Uh, other factors working against us, ironically, are the demographics. We've been so successful, people are getting older, living longer, and they're having different types of heart disease. Um, and access to care remains a problem within the United States as does adherence to medical therapy, both for blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood thinners for, for many people. So um, overall, lots of progress, but nowhere near done. So I wanted to start by talking about cholesterol. I know this is a topic that you all have heard about a lot, but I wanted to explain why um, some of you may wonder, well, my cholesterol is pretty good, but my doctor still wants me on cholesterol-lowering drugs. Um, and others uh, know your cholesterol is high and um, understand the reason. And I, to explain that, I wanted to first go over the problem that cholesterol causes. So this is a picture of the heart, the outside of the heart, and one of the arteries, or, or three arteries, that feed the heart muscle that run on the outside. And this is a cross-section here of one of those blood vessels showing of one of these cholesterol plaques developing. Now these start in all of us in our late teens and early 20s. All of us have these. And over time, they do build up. But notice how they're in the middle, there's this yellow part, that's the cholesterol. And on the outside, there's this white capsule. What happens to cause a heart attack is not the plaque getting bigger, accumulating from cholesterol. What happens to cause a, an acute heart attack is that plaque, that fibrous capsule, suddenly ruptures. And when it ruptures, there's bleeding into the blood vessel. Sounds kind of ironic, but that's what happens. And as if you cut yourself, a, a scab will form, you know, when you cut yourself, pretty quickly. Well, exactly the same thing happens inside the artery. And that's what this picture shows right here. It's that scab that forms, that closes the artery, that causes the acute heart attack, causes the chest pain, and can lead to sudden death or uh, a severe heart attack. So back to the cholesterol-lowering drugs, I want to just show this picture here. The cholesterol-lowering drugs help 
prevent the cholesterol from being absorbed when you eat it. it also, they also help uh, absorb cholesterol from your blood so that it's excreted. And both of these mechanisms result in this. This is that same artery, and see the white capsule here? It, it thickens that white capsule, and what it does is it stabilizes that plaque. So that plaque is much less likely to suddenly rupture and bleed. And by stabilizing the plaque, regardless of whether your cholesterol is normal or high, it dramatically reduces the risk of that plaque rupturing. So that's why it, we've learned it's so beneficial to be on these medications, uh, even if your cholesterol is relatively good or, or normal. Um, now, they do have side effects, and that's uh, you know, another story, but we've got many different ones, and for most people, we can come up with one that, that works for you. Now, next I want to talk about coronary stents. Um, back in the mid-1980s, uh, the technology started without anything other than a balloon. So that's the same picture of our heart here, uh, looking at one of those arteries, and again, you see the cholesterol plaque on either side. The first treatment for those plaques that didn't involve open heart surgery was to put a balloon in there to expand that artery and push that cholesterol plaque out of the way. That is something we call angioplasty, which I imagine many of you have heard of. We call it now plain old balloon angioplasty. For any of you who know someone who had it, or if you might have had it, you probably remember going back for another angioplasty a few months or a year or two later because the problem was that the plaques would always, almost always, come back. Sometimes within a matter of weeks, sometimes a year, but the plaques would always reform. So to try to combat that problem, uh, drug or met metallic stents were developed. And these are uh, made out of a metal called nitinol, which is very bendable, it's put on the outside of a balloon, which is then put into the artery, and the balloon is expanded, and that expands the struts of the stent. Then the balloon is deflated, but the stent stays up against the wall, keeping that plaque pushed back. And this turned out to be very effective at preventing the plaque from getting bigger and coming back. But another problem arose, which is that because these stents are made out of metal, blood could suddenly clot on those metal um, struts. And so we had to leave patients on very strong blood thinners for sometimes a year, sometimes for the rest of their lives. And uh, as many of you probably know, blood thinners have their own problems. So it was an improvement, uh, and, and this is still a very important therapy today, but still not perfect. So earlier this year, at the end of last year, we uh, got approval for yet another kind of new stent, which is actually completely absorbable. Uh, it's made out of a material that is similar to nitinol. It's placed in the artery over a balloon. It's expanded. It keeps the cholesterol plaque back. But over the course of two to three years, it dissolves completely so there's no metal left in the body. So this will offer a therapy that we'll be able to offer without leaving patients on lifelong blood thinners. It's still early in this technology. It is FDA approved, but uh, we know that it takes many years in general public use to really understand how beneficial this technology is going to be, but we're very, very optimistic. Uh, no, so far it's been very effective at not uh, that the plaques don't recur. Next I'm going to move on to atrial fibrillation. So I'm giving you a potpourri of uh, cardiology today. Uh, atrial fibrillation is near and dear to my heart because I am a heart rhythm specialist. Now, many of you may not know what atrial fibrillation is, so I just want to explain this first. Uh, and to explain what atrial fibrillation is, I first need to explain what the normal heart rhythm or heart beat is. And so I have this picture here on the left of a cross section of the heart with the two top chambers, the atria, which are 
fairly small, and then the bottom chamber is the ventricles. The bottom chambers pump most of the blood. The atria are very small and don't really contribute much to the overall pumping. Well, the heart is a muscle, of course, just like any other muscle. And what causes any muscle in our body to squeeze is electricity. And we are all born with a normal pacemaker at the top of our heart called the SA node. This is a special group of nerve cells that has the ability to generate an electrical signal about once every second. And that electrical signal then travels down nerves through the heart muscle from top to bottom. And as the electricity passes by the heart muscle, it causes that muscle to squeeze, first the top chambers and then the bottom chambers. And that's the normal heart rhythm that I suspect most, if not everyone here, is in today. But as we get older, the way electricity passes through the muscle cells changes, and electricity can become disorganized in the top chambers, leading to multiple sites firing randomly <coughs> in the top chambers. So if you imagine my hand as the top chambers, instead of them squeezing regularly, they just quiver. And that causes the blood to pool, and that can lead to two problems. One is blood clots can form in the top chambers, and those blood clots can be pushed out, and they can cause a stroke. The other problem that can occur is that the bottom chambers of the heart beat irregularly and rapidly, sometimes too slowly, and that can make many people uncomfortable, causing people to feel shortness of breath, palpitations, um, sometimes just not as much energy. Some people don't feel it at all, but most people do have some symptoms. Now, atrial fibrillation, as I mentioned, is age-related. So this is the demographics of atrial fibrillation between 2000 and what we anticipate in 2050. Right now, somewhere between two and a half and five million Americans have atrial fibrillation. And with the changing demographics, we expect this number to at least double by 2050. Uh, and by age 80, about two in every 10 Americans will have atrial fibrillation. So it's very common. We have a couple of great treatments uh, for atrial fibrillation. Uh, one is a procedure called a catheter ablation. This is a catheter-based <coughs> procedure similar to an angiogram, uh, but takes a little bit longer, where we get access from the, artery, the vein and the groin, and we thread catheters up to the heart and we apply small amount of heat to burn the places that are triggering atrial fibrillation. And this has led to a very successful cure of atrial fibrillation in up to 85, 90% of patients, especially when we catch it early. The most concerning part of atrial fibrillation, though, is the blood clots and stroke that form. And so our number one priority is always to protect patients from those blood clots. And here, I have shown uh, a larger picture of the upper chambers because I wanted to show you this little pouch that comes off the left upper chamber, which is called the left atrial appendage. It turns out this is where the blood actually pools and where the blood clots form that can then go on to cause strokes. The most effective treatment and the only treatment we had until about a year ago is lifelong blood thinners. Uh, the number one blood thinner is Coumadin or Warfarin or rat poison, which I have a feeling at least one of you may have taken at one point in your lives here. It's not a great drug, but it saved many, many lives and prevented many, many strokes. Fortunately, we have newer medications that are in many ways better now, but blood thinners are still the number one treatment for patients who have atrial fibrillation. However, there are some patients who simply cannot take blood thinners, either because they have recurrent bleeding or their professions prevent them from being able to take it safely, and some people flat out refuse. We do now have an alternative treatment which is almost as effective, uh, which is a small umbrella-like plug that we can place from a catheter, again, from the groin up to the heart, and we can actually close this left atrial appendage with this uh, small little device. 
and that brings the risk of stroke almost as low as if somebody were taking blood thinners uh, every day. So now there really is no reason we shouldn't be able to protect every patient who has atrial fibrillation from stroke. Pacemakers. We've got some exciting news in pacemakers. Um, you may know that most pacemakers um, are placed usually in the left upper chest, and they have one or two wires that go into the vein and down into the heart. And they're very effective at preventing the heart from beating too slowly, and they've been a life-saving therapy that's been around since um, the late, early 1960s, really, but since the mid-70s, they've been very, very common. Now, the technology is terrific, but the leads that, that extend from the pacemaker down to the heart are under tremendous strain because the heart is moving every second. And that tension can lead the wires to break. Also, bacteria frequently get into our blood and there's always a small risk that the bacteria could stick to the wires and cause a very dangerous blood infection. So we're very excited um, to recently have approved an entirely leadless pacemaker, which is about two centimeters long and is implanted again from the groin up to the heart. And then it's just deployed right in the apex, right in the tip of this uh, right lower chamber. And the only thing that's there is that tiny little uh, pellet. And that has a battery and a computer that works as a full functioning pacemaker and the battery lasts for 10 years. So uh, we're very excited that this technology is available. It's early still, it only can pace one chamber. Most patients still need a two chamber pacemaker, so it's not appropriate for most people yet, but you can be sure it's only uh, a matter of a short period of time until we've got a uh, leadless pacemaker, which is what this is called that can pace two chambers and even three. So big advance there. Valve surgery. So my father had valve replacement surgery in 2002, and he was in the hospital for about a week, which was a short period of time. He had a recovery that lasted about three months, a lot of pain in his chest, um, but it's been a godsend, and he's um, doing well. I'm happy to report. Um, but we have amazing technology that now allows us to replace heart valves often without any surgery whatsoever. And so I just want to share this with you. Um, and I'm going to talk about one particular type of valve, the aortic valve. There are two valves in the heart that usually are the ones that become dysfunctional if somebody has valvular heart disease. Um, the aorta aortic valve is the most common. So up until a few years ago, well, this is what my father had. They would break your sternum and open your heart, put you on bypass surgery. But they made progress, and they were able to do what was called a minimally invasive approach, where they could make a smaller incision only a few centimeters. Although it really was almost as painful, and many surgeons didn't like it because they couldn't see what they were doing very well. So this never really caught on. Then they developed a technique that would allow them to get access to the heart from just below the heart outside without actually opening the chest. But again, the results were not terrific, and so it, it didn't, uh, didn't catch on. More recently, they got access from above the heart, which was better, but now they're able to do the entire procedure from, again, the groin, now the artery in the groin, they can get access to the groin with a fairly large IV catheter, and they thread a balloon and a, a valve over that balloon up to the heart. And when they get to that aortic position right here, they expand the balloon. Uh, and again, it's like that other stent. So when you expand the nitinol, it stays expanded. Then you retract the balloon and take everything out. And the only thing that's left there is the stent. And this allows patients to have complete valve replacement surgery in a matter of hours, and often they can go home in a day or two with nothing but a sore groin where the catheter was placed. It's just amazing. Uh, this technology is evolving very quickly, 
I think it will soon be commonly used for mitral valve surgery as well. Yes? Is, is this done while the blood is being pumped? Yep. It doesn't require any heart-lung bypass. Yep. Good question. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. So this is the uh, closest we've got to we've gotten to an artificial heart. Um, this is what's called a mechanical assist device. Uh, it still requires an outside battery pack, but the surgeons can place, uh, this is the pump right here, it attaches to the bottom ventricle and then it goes up to the aorta, the main blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart. So for people whose hearts are so weak that they will die unless they get a heart transplant, this is an important bridge to them getting their heart transplant or in some people, it actually can substitute because the devices are getting so small and so effective and safe. So um, definitely stay tuned. You're going to hear more about these heart assist devices in the coming years. Okay, I'm going to close with a couple of things that I think uh, it's very important for everybody, regardless of whether they're in medicine or not, to know. Uh, there's an enormous amount that each one of you can do for yourselves or your loved ones to reduce the chance of having heart disease. And it doesn't matter if you are starting, if you started two months ago or today, these, these all can have a very quick effect. Now, blood pressure um, is, blood pressure, smoking, and high cholesterol affect almost everybody who has heart disease. One of those three is present in almost everyone. And we, smoking is by far the worst. If you're a smoker today and you stop today, you will help yourself as of a week from now. It doesn't take long at all. Uh, blood pressure, we've got a ton of medications now. We've got great ways to take it home and monitor it. The hard part about blood pressure is you don't feel it when it's abnormal, so it's easy to ignore. But it is a ticking time bomb, and it puts a huge stress on not just your heart, but your blood vessels, not only in the heart, but also in the brain. So it's uh, critically important to control to reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke. Uh, other factors, high cholesterol. I hope the slides earlier helped explain why it's so helpful to take the medications for cholesterol for everybody who's been advised by their doctor. It's not the total cholesterol, but it's stabilizing those plaques. Alcohol, you know, in moderation, we, we know is okay, but in excess, it can be a problem. Uh, diabetes, a very, very serious problem. Uh, for those of you who have it, you understand, uh, but we do have great therapies now, so it's important to work with your doctor to keep that uh, well controlled. Weight is a huge epidemic, um, and uh, you know, even if you can only lose a few pounds, it makes more than a big difference. And physical activity. You know, just getting out there and walking each day, taking a group exercise class, that makes a big difference. So uh, being a couch potato greatly increases your risk. So what should you know? Signs and symptoms to look for. Well, first of all, uh, you know, healthy lifestyle, as I mentioned, see your primary care doctor regularly, Dr. Bright, and when he tells you, you know, come see us. But those are the ground, those are the key foundations to, to being healthy and picking up heart disease soon. In this month of heart awareness, uh, heart health awareness, we've learned that um, many people don't have the typical symptoms of heart disease that we think of, especially women. So. If you have a change in your symptoms, such as nausea, lightheadedness, or cold sweats, that can sometimes be a sign that you may be suffering from heart disease. Sometimes a change in your exercise capacity, shortness of breath, uh, and often discomfort in your arms, back, neck, jaw, or upper stomach, things that you might not associate with your heart. The nerves in the chest are not like the nerves in the hands. That's why sometimes people have a heart attack and they feel pain in their jaw or their arm. So if you notice those changing symptoms, certainly touch base with Dr. Bright or Dr. Singer. Um, and of course, everybody does know chest pain. That is a sign that we all should watch for. 
despite the fact that we know it, every year we see many heroic people who fight off, you know, coming to the doctor because they ignore their chest pain. Not a good idea. Um, definitely not recommended because if we get to it early, we can make a huge difference. So this is us. This is New York Presbyterian Queens. We are your neighbors, uh, and these are our, uh, this is the map up in my office wall with the little stickers. We're expanding quickly, but here is our uh, main uh, hospital in downtown, or in Flushing, not downtown. Uh, here's our cardiac health center, uh, which has a phenomenal group of uh, exercise physiologists, dietitians, and cardiologists who specialize in cardiac rehab. You don't have to be a cardiac patient to go there. They have all sorts of programs uh, which cost about as much as a regular gym membership, but you get much, much more. It's a great resource, and we can put you in touch. For those of you who've had a heart attack or other problems, uh, that's usually covered by insurance, and that's a whole other level of care, and they're just superb at it. Uh, we have multi-specialty practices in Whitestone, Bayside, Forest Hills, Maspeth, and Astoria, and we're opening others soon, and we have same-day appointments uh, in every location. And this is who we are, uh, and we're also expanding uh, regular, uh, frequently. We have five new cardiologists who will be joining us as of July 1st, this coming year, but this is who we are right now, and all of us can be reached uh, by calling that number. So I'm going to just leave that slide up here, and I'll pause here, and thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to, uh, to taking your questions. Too short?